The meeting is now live. Thank you.
Well, good evening, members, officers, visitors, and members of the public. I'm Councillor Tim Gibson, and I'll be chairing this evening's meeting. The meeting will be recorded and proceedings will be conducted in accordance with the Council's constitution, including procedural rules, which are available on the Council's website. There is no planned evacuation drill this evening, and accordingly, if the alarm sounds, it's to be treated as a genuine need to evacuate. There are emergency exits to my right, or through the passageway to my left as you leave the chamber, and then via the main staircase at the front of the building. Please note, lifts must not be used. The assembly point is on the far side of the car park, and it's important you remain there and do not return to the building until I have announced it is safe to do so. If anyone present will need assistance in evacuating and negotiating the stairs, could you please inform me now so we can make necessary arrangements to assist you? Thank you. This meeting has a quasi-judicial role and determines the rights and obligations of the applicant. Members must consider each application and everything that is said in the meeting concerning the application and make their decision based solely on their planning judgment of the information available to them. Following a decision by members, delegated authority is given to the planning officer to issue the decision notice and planning permission is not granted or refused until the issue of that decision notice. Any member of the council who is not a member of the planning committee may attend as a visiting member and may speak having given prior notification. Such visiting members may of course include ward members and whilst visiting members can speak on an application, they are not permitted to vote. Any member acting as a substitute on the planning committee must have undertaken the appropriate training before doing so. And members must remain in the meeting for the whole time that each item is being debated and should not vote on the item unless they have done so. I'd now like to welcome our public speakers and remind you that you have three minutes to speak and an audible warning of time will be given when there are 30 seconds remaining. If the meeting is deferred to conduct a site meeting, you may speak both at this meeting and at the site meeting, but there'll be no further opportunity to speak on the matter when it comes back to the planning committee. The meeting will follow the order set out in the agenda. However, I will amend the order if there's good reason for doing so. And in particular, I'll take any items where a member of the public is registered to speak first before moving on to the remainder of the agenda and I will verbally reorder the agenda as appropriate. Now we'll move on to item two, which is apologies for absence and any substitutes, please. Thank you, Chairman. Apologies have been received from Councillor Tim Valentine, who is substituted by Councillor Alistair Gould from Councillor Monique Bonney, who was substituted by Councillor Denise Knights, and from Councillor Paul Stephen, who was substituted by Councillor Derek Carnell, and also apologies from Councillor Richard Darby. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, item three on the agenda, which is to approve the minutes of the meeting held on the 10th of February, 2022. Minute numbers 587 to 589. That's a correct record. Members, do we do so? Thank you. Item four, could I now invite members' declarations of disclosable pecuniary interests and disclosable non-pecuniary interests? Councillor Simmons, please. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairman. Yes, the applicants to do with uh, uh, application number 2150341, uh, Mount E-Frame, the applicants are known to me. Thank you. We now move on to item five, which is the planning working group. And can we approve the minutes of the meeting held on the 1st of March 2022, please, members? Thank you. We now consider, first of all, each of those planning working group meetings that have come back uh, this evening. Some nasty echo in here. Thank you. And the first one is a 20 oblique uh, 505 921 oblique out, and that's land at Highfield Road, Minster on Sea. And I'll thank the officer to give us um, an outline and any updates, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so as members will be aware, the item was first brought before you on the 10th of February. It's an outline scheme for 16 units with all matters reserved aside from access. And the item was deferred for a site visit, which was subsequently held on the 1st of March. 
and is before you again tonight for your consideration. The application is recommended for approval subject to conditions and um, an appropriately worded legal agreement. Um, if I could just share my screen. Can you see that OK? Yes, thank you. Um, so these photos have been sent in from the agents to give an idea of the the street scene on an average day um, as there's an awareness that at a site visit there will be um, additional people attending um, in association with that visit. So then the agent has provided a number of photos taken on various different days to give an idea of the street scene um, on an average day. So the 5th of March, 6th of March, the 8th of March, the 9th of March, and finally the 10th of March. Um, I have no further update uh, following the previous planning committee and site visit. Thank you. Thank you very much. I therefore move the officer recommendation. Could I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Jays. And first of all, I'll um, come to you, Councillor Birch, should you wish as it's within your ward to speak on this first. Yeah, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, members who came out to view the site. Um, just looking at those pictures and the timestamps, I noticed they're all taken during the working day. Um, it's a shame there's no photos of it taking in the evening when everyone actually comes home and has to park somewhere. Um, My, my concerns here, again, you can see that gate on the left in that photo is where the access will be. Um, we were told that it was a considerable distance from the brow of the hill. As you can see from that photo, the brow of the hill is blind. Um, if there are parked cars and a vehicle is coming over there, I do still have highways concerns and this is an item that we're looking at for access. Um, Kent Highways have told us the visibility displays are fine. Um, I would have liked to have seen an independent report from our independent traffic um, highways expert, but we haven't got that. Um, my, my real issue here is it's the local countryside gap. So we go through a local plan process where we set out exactly where we will and won't accept development. And we set out a boundary line of where we say this is an important countryside gap that should be retained to stop bleed into the countryside. Every time we look at a local plan, we have to change those boundaries slightly to accommodate. And I'm thinking of particular the land at Barton Hill Drive where the boundary line that used to go down now goes across to accommodate the land that we allocated. So in the most recent schla this site was put forward and the officer's comment was this site is surrounded by a number of existing local plan allocations that is why it's a countryside gap because if you close the gap you're, you're bringing two distinct areas together so what we're looking at here is the gap between the village of halfway and the parish of minster on sea and we can see the confusion from the last planning meeting that we allowed Minster on Sea Parish Council to comment on this application, even though it's not in their in their patch. Um, I went on the council's planning portal today and used the measuring tool. I don't know how accurate that is. However, the boundary for this site and the boundary for the 700 home development at Barton Hill Drive is 90 metres. So we are closing the countryside gap between halfway and this huge development that's going to be built on the lower road to 90 metres. That is not an acceptable countryside gap and I think eroding that would be unforgivable and totally contrary to local and national policy. So I won't be supporting the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Marchington, did you want to? Thank you, Chair. When I the comment, I Thank you. Members, Councillor Winkless, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I attended the site meeting. This is a difficult one for me. I've taken on board what the Ward Councillor uh, 
Cameron Burton said, the fact that it, it's in a countryside gap. But um, one of the, the things I noticed was the the rusty gates, um, which we had to go through. Uh, that part of it to me is an eyesore, but once we got inside, yes, there is a lot of some fruit trees and uh, quite a lot of green vegetation, a barn that would obviously mean let go. But I do feel that um, if we was to vote against this tonight, and I said I had grave concerns about which one I'm going to vote on this, that we would lose on appeal. That's all I've got to say on this one. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jones, please. I too noted that the pictures were taken at school run time slash during the working day. Um, we could defer for an independent highway assessment, but I think Councillor Beer has enough reasons for this to be refused, and I'll be supporting him in that. Thank you. Members, anybody else? OK, uh, those in favour of the officer recommendation to approve. Those against. Thank you. Abstentions, please. So the substantive motion has fallen. We now need um, from the floor, please, a reason for refusal. Councillor Beard. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, Sorry, could I, could I just tell me before we go? I invite Mr. Freeman to. Thank you, Chair. Um, in accordance with the, sorry, in accordance with the council's constitution. In cases where the committee is minded to make a decision that would be contrary to officer recommendation and contrary to policy and or guidance, I defer the planning application to a future planning committee in order to advise members on the prospects of the success of such a decision if challenged at appeal and if it becomes the subject of an application for costs. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So it's called in and uh, deferred members. Come to be it, please. On that basis, if the officers are going to bring it back, can we have the independent highways analysis on this, please? I would support that. Thank and you. Just for the record, can we have the figures for the vote? Yes, you can. 14 against, two for, and two abstentions. 14 against, two abstentions. Thank you. Right, so we now move on to item. 21 oblique 502609 oblique out and that's land to the east of Linstead Lane, Linstead ME9 and 9QN and I thank the officer for um, an outline and any updates please. Thank you chairman, um, good evening members. Um, you'll have noted the report that the tabled report that was circulated earlier today which picks up on a number of points from the member site visit last week. Um, so, I'd, so I won't go um, over all of that, just save to reiterate that officers are pretty much at a view um, that outline planning permission should be granted for this scheme for up to 10 dwellings um, at Linstead Lane, uh, Linstead, subject to conditions and to the signing of a suitably worded section 106 agreement. Um, I'll share my screen, Chairman. Thank you. Right, I'm I've just just shared the um site location plan and um the constraints plans. So hopefully you can see those. Um so yeah, back back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
Could I now invite uh, Councillor Bowen, please, uh, to speak as a ward uh, council member? Yeah, I'd remind you, you have three minutes. Thank you very thank much, you. Mr Chairman. Uh, and thank you to all the members who came to the site visit and saw the road issues that will blight this application if it's approved. And also thanks to the many residents who have attended this evening to show the depth of feeling. Yeah. It has come to our notice in the last few days an issue with the transport statement that, in my opinion, has a huge Im impact on this application. And my thanks to Lindsay Parish Council for highlighting this. The transport statement commissioned by the developers, in particular parking beat survey in Lindsay Lane, paragraphs 461 to 4611. This analysis is totally inappropriate and misrepresentative. Two surveys were undertaken, both overnight at half past midnight. Why was no survey undertaken during the working day? Overnight parking is not the same as li living community use of the lane. The surveys therefore failed to take into account the real time use of Linstead Lane, the dynamics of which are severely interfered, uh, in interfered with by this application. Paragraph 465 asserts that there is no excessive parking on the street in Linstead Lane. This is completely incorrect. It fails to take into account the residents who park throughout the day in order to visit the amenities on London Road, the pharmacy, the vets, co-op, post office, library, etc. You cannot park directly outside the cart because of double yellow lines and the box junction. The survey fails to take into account the delivery vehicles and other tradesmen who need to park in Linstead Lane. It fails to take into account the bottlenecks constantly caused when HGVs, buses and agricultural vehicles encounter these parked cars in this narrow lane. None of the above scenarios occur at half past midnight. Paragraph 467 states, while some parking on the western side of Linstead Lane was observed, this is further south from the proposed site access and does not need to be compensated. This parking is minimal. This is inadequate assessment of the reality. Now we've spoken to residents to establish the facts. Two of the homeowners currently work night shifts, so their cars may not have been parked on, on the two nights the survey was undertaken at half past midnight. One of the surveys was carried out, uh, say a half, half midnight on a Saturday night, Sunday morning. Some residents may therefore not have, may not have returned from a nice evening out or may have been away for the weekend. And some of the residents currently do not own a car, but that may not necessarily be the case in the future. Paragraph 467 concludes that residents are using their off-street parking. What attempt has been made to establish what off-street parking exists? Of the 14 properties on the western side of Linstead Lane, nearest to the A2, no fewer than seven have no off-street parking at all. Of the remaining seven, some households have more cars than off-street spaces. Paragraph 466 alleges that the proposal does not diminish from the parking amenity available for the current residents. Parking 4610 alleges that there is no significant disbenefit to root users who park opposite the proposed access. It may seem to some that the facts are very misleading, possibly even twisted to suit the narrative. I urge members, look at this application and in all honesty, it can only be refused. Please, thank you. Thank you very much. Could I now invite Councillor Mike White in uh, to speak on this as ward member? Uh, Chairman, thank you very much. I can't see a red light here, but I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. And can I join Lloyd in thanking uh, the residents of Linstead Lane um, in, for their attendance this evening and for the work that the parish council in Linstead with Kingsdown has done on this. Um, Today, Mr Chairman, planning permission to build five houses on land east of Cellar Hill has been refused by the Council. Um, Linstead Lane and Cellar Hill are parallel lanes with similar characteristics. The recommendation by officers to approve Linstead Lane appears to me to totally conflict with their decision today to refuse Cellar Hill. Uh, if I may, Chairman, I'll give an excerpt from the Cellar Hill refusal. The Council remains firm in its position that sites which are located outside any built up area boundary and in the uh, designated countryside are covered by national and local planning policies which restrict development in the countryside and policy uh, ST3 seeks to guide development uh, to sustainable locations which it defines by the use of built up area boundaries. The application site is located outside of the built up boundaries. 
Uh, boundary lines like this are not drawn without purpose or in the absence of careful deliberation and, uh, and are not accepted without independent examination for soundness. And such boundaries are also not to be regarded as fuzzy edges. I quote that. And to do so would uh, inevitably lead to uh, incremental outward expansion of the urban area, the piecemeal erosion of its rural margins and the undermining of the quantitative and locational reasons that gave rise to the actual boundary alignment being agreed. Uh, this council, it says in the Cellar Hill refusal, uh, doesn't seem uh, to be firm in its position where Linstead Lane, sorry, the council doesn't appear uh, to be firm in its position where Linstead Lane is concerned, uh, despite this site also being outside the settlement boundary. The issues regarding traffic have been well rehearsed um, and, and were well rehearsed at the site meeting. And I thank your committee members, Chairman, uh, for the time they gave to attend that. And I thank those uh, residents who spoke. Um, but the whole give way site the system seems to me to be unworkable um okay that's your three minutes thank you thank you uh councillor valentine as a visiting member do you wish to speak on this one yeah thank you chair can i just check that you can hear me okay yes loud and clear thank you OK, thank you. Um, so I attended the site visit um, along with many other people. Um, I, we've, we, I mean, Councillor Whiting was just talking about the access issues on Linstead Lane, and I think I um, would like to add my support to that. To be honest, I really don't understand why officers either from this council or from um, Kent Highways are supporting this application. Um, it's going to cause an obstruction to traffic just metres from the A2. So if um, traffic travelling north onto the A2 fail to give way, and they may well fail to give way because they can't see the traffic that's going to turn off the A2 but hasn't yet turned, um, and that will cause a, a bottleneck and an obstruction with traffic quite possibly um, tailing back onto the A2 itself. The car parking um, from the, and it, in that view that's on the screen now where the blue bin is, there was a line of cars parked down there during the uh, site visit. And they at least provide some refuge for um, residents who come out of their houses straight onto the road there. There's, there's no pavement. Um, whereas if a new entrance is built opposite that, those cars will not be able to park there and the residents will lose that um, facility to park outside their houses, but also use that lose that refuge as they as they come out on straight into the traffic. Um, the pedestrian access um, to the north of the site straight onto the A2 through the uh, wood yard seems to me completely inappropriate. So that's uh, an access for a farmer to access his field occasionally. Um, whereas this application turns it into a, a public right of way for people to access a housing estate. So you're going to have pedestrians mixing with the traffic and the frequent deliveries at the uh, carpentry business, which I think is unsafe and um, very unfair on, on that business. And I understand that we have to consider the application before us, uh, which is for 10 houses, but it's a a matter of um, public record that this site has been promoted for the local plan review um, for development for 50 houses. Um, and although we must, must restrict ourselves to the planning issues, I don't think we should be taken for fools either. And um, we should be cognizant of those wider, those wider issues. Um, also at the site visits, there was talk about the Linstead design statement, which was uh, where these um, lines for the built up boundaries are built because the aim is to preserve the typical settlement pattern of uh, one house deep um, along the uh, roadways there. 
whereas obviously this would break that historic settlement pattern entirely. So it seems to go against a lot of our planning policies. I don't understand why uh, it should be supported. Thank you, Councillor Valentine. That's your three minutes. <laughs> Members, I therefore move the officer recommendation for approval. Do have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Jays. I've got Councillor Winkless and Councillor Beat, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, again, I did attend the site meeting. I'm not going to go over what uh, the previous speakers tonight have said. I had I echo the same concerns. Um, the first one is um, which uh, last speaker mentioned was people going through past the. Uh, the wood, you know, the carpentry business. Um, I think that is unacceptable. And I also, when we went to the second uh, part of the site, I have grave concerns about the visibility. I went and stood on that side of the bank and looked up and down both sides. And I've used that road many a times and I've cut through to the other, other part of Keith, as I call it. And as it stands, I cannot support this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Beer, please. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Similarly to my comments on the last one, although this isn't in a countryside gap, it is outside the built up area boundary. And I think Councillor Whiting's point about that, or well, I think it was actually an officer's point that he was quoting about, we don't just see these as fuzzy lines. We set these lines out in policy. They go through a local plan process and are found sound by an inspector. Um, and we adopt them as where we will and won't accept development. Um, I had a look at the application at Cellar uh, Hill, which is obviously the next lane along. And what I found quite stark was one of the reasons we offered for refusal was that the road was extremely narrow and poorly aligned. Well, ha having parked in Linstead Lane for the site visit, I would say that completely complies with Linstead Lane as well. Um, what I was also taken back by, and I can understand why, because it's the Cellar Hill one is an application for five dwellings, but in the officer's report, Kent Highways did not respond to the consultation. So we put forward a reason for refusal on highways grounds without Kent Highways' comment on it. And, and I'm baffled that we are taking the advice on Linstead Lane, which frankly, I see very little difference with. Um, the access is still poor. Even the access onto the A2 is pretty poor. Um, but I mean, I, I parked in Linstead Lane just as the bus was coming along there. I'm amazed it's still a bus route. I'm surprised the bus company haven't withdrawn it for the fact that it's so difficult to get along there. Um, add in farm traffic, um, any sort of delivery vehicles going along there. I, I just cannot understand how this is up for approval um, when we're getting contradictory officer reports for a site next to it or opposite on the opposite lane which has gone through delegated refusal but very bizarre okay thank you councillor martin please uh, i've got grave concerns around this one actually um, i think the advice from kcc and the consultation response from kcc is quite frankly ludicrous i think you know, having had relatives live on sites where you do have to cross the yard of a joinery to get to them. You don't visit them during the day because you don't want to get hit by a lorry. Um, I'm not saying that joineries don't behave themselves and have banksmen, they do, but they're not going to be looking out for people every five minutes. It's completely unreasonable to that business and that access is completely inappropriate. We're told that actually the public rights of way don't really apply to it because it will be a private access to so the Highways Act 1980 doesn't apply. So they don't have to worry about the safety of pedestrians on that route. Great for KCC, but not great for the residents that will live there and certainly not great for the business. Uh, in terms of the access on Linstead Lane, it's a joke as it is. Quite frankly, if you're driving down there at, uh, at either of the peak times, you, you watch the cars try and go in and out. They struggle. Even with the box junction there, they struggle with great difficulty and that leads to congestion both on the A2 and the lane itself. It's completely inappropriate for development. I think, as has already been stated, you know, this has been put forward in the Schlaf for 50 houses. 
to come up with an application for 10 tells me that they're trying to avoid desperately having any affordable units on there because it's just below that threshold to have any affordable units. Well done, developer. You're trying to save yourself a few bob there, aren't you? Quite frankly, it's a ludicrous location. It's not suitable. It's not good. It's not a good expansion of realistically it's in Linstead, but let's face it, it would be an expansion of Tenham. It's not suitable. I can't support the officers on this one, I'm afraid. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Dender, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I concur with everything that's been said by the other speakers up till now. Um, they took a couple of questions already that I was going to ask. Uh, but I just want to quote here um, a paragraph from the paper. I know the PC have made some comments regarding parking dem demand along Linstead Lane for the co-op and other shops. However, that is not a matter that could be taken into account for this application. I honestly do not understand that. Anyone who has walked along that road by the George or across the road there, of course the cars are going to be parked down there because they can't park anywhere on the A2. So that, that statement frankly astounds me that you can't take it into account for the application. Of course you can. The, right, the cars will continue to park down there even if there are 10 houses. I completely concur that the developer is playing games, pushing 10, ready to go for the 50 at a later date. I also find absurd on this statement here that KCC highways have indicated that schemes subject to conditions will improve the current highway network situation. That's laughable. It really is laughable. And I also note, and let's make it clear here, significant weight also needs to be given to the lack of a five year housing supply. And this wouldn't go through at all if we didn't have that lack. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Hunt, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, I've looked at the Cellar Hill um, refusal as well, um, and I think that Obviously, I think I can see the way that this may be going, but I do think we have to be careful with the, um, the fact that it's outside the built up area boundary. The Cellar Hill refusal was quite different to this, although it was given the refusal was because it's outside the built up area boundary. The main reasons uh, was because of the impact on the conservation area and listed buildings where this the, the land at that point was in between. And it was the impacts on that which was then tipping the balance of it then being on the outside the built up area boundary whereas this site isn't next to the conservation area and not as much impact on listed buildings as, as that other site so i do think we have to be careful when looking at that it is obvious that there are highways issues um at the moment i'm a, a bit on the fence with this because we've got KCC Highways commenting and they, they hadn't commented on Cellar Hill because it was under 10 properties, um, but they're commenting and saying it's acceptable with, with all the highway improvements that are coming forward. So it is going to be a difficult one, but um, there, there is also the issue of people crossing the, the lands where the, um, the business is there. And I think I would be listening to those that have been to the site visit because I was unable to attend. And if they're still saying that they have concerns, then I would be agreeing with them. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hall, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just like to say that in all the years I've been a planning member, I don't think there's ever been such an easier decision to make. I absolutely not support this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Simmons, please. Thank, th thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I agree with, with much of that, that which has been said already, but I, I'd like to raise two, two concerns, additional concerns that I have. The first is the, the access, um, the right of way over, but not on, the, uh, by FJ Williams Joinery. Uh, I have experience of this as a farmer, um, not this particular place, but with rights, rights of way over, over through farmland. And my understanding is that Mr. Williams said at the site meeting that the gates are locked at night. 
Presumably, he will then have to supply each of the, the residents in the new development with a set of keys so that they, they can unlock and lock it. And do we really believe that people will actually lock gates behind them? I'm afraid they don't. They, they don't. And um, I, I know that from experience. So I think that is a very, a very flawed area. The other area which astounds me is that the uh, provision of 25 car parking bays for this development, uh, 20 for the residents, two for visitors, and three bays for the existing residents on Linstead Lane. Um, the, the, there are more than three, three residents on Linstead Lane who are going to be affected by this, this development, and I, I can't see how we could possibly uh, support it. Um, and I'm very surprised that, that it has come up for approval this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr Jeffers, can I bring you in at this stage, please? Thank you, Chairman. Just a brief word to members. The application in front of you is for Linstead Lane, and therefore members need to consider the, pro the merits of that case um, rather than the one we've also heard in terms of the one at Cellar Hill. Um, I don't know much about the application, but what I can tell you is that KCC Highways weren't consulted on the application because it didn't come within the protocol, which is six dwellings or more, and then we actually consult KCC Highways. That, was, that one was for five dwellings, smaller site, in a different location. Um, that's all I needed to say. Thank you at this stage. OK, thank you. Members, anybody else wish to comment before we go to the vote? OK, so those in favour of the officer's recommendation for approval. Those against. Uh, that's unanimous. Um, Mr Freeman, over to you. Thank you. Um, Um, in accordance with the Council's constitution, in cases where the committee is minded to make a decision that would be contrary to officer recommendation and contrary to policy and or guidance, I defer the planning application to future planning committee in order to advise members on the prospects of success of such a decision if challenged at appeal and if it becomes the subject of an application for costs. And just for members' minds, we'll also get independent highways advice as part of that as well. Chair, thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Could you put your microphone on, Councillor Dender? Thank you. Sorry, if we get independent hires advice, could the bus route be included as part of that? Thank you. Yes, OK. Thank you. And Councillor Hunt, please. Chair, could, as there's a lot of residents, could we just give an explanation of the process of what's happened? No. Yes, of course. So um, effectively, if um, members are minded to refuse an application, which is contrary to um, officer's recommendation, um, and then before we go um, to a formal resolution uh, out onto the floor again and reasons for refusal, um, the head of planning gets the opportunity to what you call in the application uh, and defer it whilst he takes further advice, gets further information. Um, to come back with uh, potential issues for the authority um, should we decide to to go ahead with um, a refusal. Mr Freeman, I'd actually like to add any more to that. It, it's, it's basically just to advise members if it was to go to appeal, what the prospects would be at an appeal. Um, and also if there were potential cost implications for the council are going to appeal as well. So it's just giving advice to members so they've got that to take into account when they make a decision. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know whether you want to make your safe journey home before the committee members proceed with the rest.
Members, we'll just pause the meeting to allow people to leave safely. OK, members, thank you very much indeed. So we'll now uh, move on to item six, which is to consider the attached head of planning report uh, parts two and five. And to that end, uh, we'll commence with item uh, two one, please. And I'll thank you officer for an outline and any updates. Thank you. Right, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, Graham Thomas, I'm hoping I can share my screen with you. Oh, here we go. One moment. Do you have that? Yes, we do indeed. OK, so this is an application for a single house in a countryside location. The countryside location is marked by this small red shape in the middle of this map I'm trying to highlight for you. And just to, to set the context, this is outside the built up area boundary of Bourne Stroke Dunkirk, which is this urban area here. It's in a special landscape area denoted by the horizontal green stripes. It's on a designated rural lane denoted by the green dots, and it's opposite the historic parkland of Mount Ephraim, which is over here, denoted by the vertical brown stripes. Um, the general nature of the site is like this. It's a traditional walled garden with high brick walls on four sides. It's this big rectangular spot here. Next to it is a bungalow. This part of the site is in the same ownership, it's largely here for site line purposes. There's no building proposed in this area where I'm showing you to the south or to, to the east actually of the bungalow. It's all to do with building inside this walled garden with access between the bungalow and the walled garden. And the overall nature of the development is on this slide, which shows the bungalow I just showed you, the walled garden's the other around this photograph. We're looking north and this. OK, so instead of the wall garden being what is it now effectively an empty space with a potting shed along the northern wall next to the road, we have this house here shown by the multiple black roofs um, echoing the multiple roofs of greenhouses and the landscaping of the site, which is divided into quadrants in the way that traditional wall gardens are, one spot for some sort of vegetables, flowers, uh, fruits, etc. So it echoes that historic pattern. There's an unheated um, open pool here, solar panels on the roof of the potting shed and garage here with an access through the wall here. It avoids using this access, which is straight onto the main road, um, but is a very, but it's, an old, it's an old Victorian access, so it isn't designed with current vehicle sight lines in mind. Just a second, there we are. So this, this is the gate that exists. Um, a wider view would be like this. You bear with me, it's coming. Well, that, that's, the, that's the gate and the wall, as you said, the wall very much hugs the roadside, so it isn't really possible to get traditional vehicle sight lines. But what the proposal is, is to create a new gateway here, the old gateways between these two piers, it's quite narrow and very near the road, a new entrance here to take a hole out of the wall there and to build those multiple roofs within the garden. So that takes us from where we are at the bottom of the page to the middle picture there. And um, going perhaps going back to the overall um, layout. I'm oh, sorry. What we could what we can find is is that this is the intended result um, with the, the house here. So the pot, the pool, the potting shed converted into a, a garage and ancillary facilities and the lack and the landscape, all within the existing brick wall, um, which is it looks rather like this um, from the west side at the minute, looking over the wall into the empty garden with the potting shed on the left. So the house would be along this wall um, on the far side of the wall garden. And this is this is agricultural land outside. So 
maybe the best view for you to look at it really um as i say is the overall artist's impression it gives that overview as to how it might sit with the sort of park and maybe from over there there's no update on the application it's all in the report as far as i know and mr hughes is here to speak to you um for his three minutes thank you jim thank you very much could i now invite uh, mr rob hughes please to speak on this item Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robert Hughes, a Chartered Town Planning Consultant and the agent for the application, which is submitted on behalf of the applicants, Mr and Mrs Wallace, who are residents of the local area. The recommendation for approval follows a lengthy, supportive pre-application and then planning application process that started over three years ago. The proposal has been finessed and enhanced since the early iterations of the scheme, and with the assistance of your planning, design and conservation officers, it has reached a stage where the application is wholly policy compliant and satisfies all of the requirements set out in paragraph 80E of the MPPF. The outstanding quality of the proposals has been assessed and endorsed by an independent design review panel made up of experts in the architecture, landscape, heritage and ecology fields, and the panel's involvement helped shape the scheme as it passed through the design phases and now carries their full support. The design process we have adopted is promoted both by the LPA and the MPPF, and your officers have been involved every step of the way. We fully endorse the recommendation of your planning officers, which is based on the merits of the scheme and its compliance with planning policy. The design team behind the scheme are specialists in this particular type of proposal and have amassed an unparalleled level of experience with such schemes securing planning permission on over 25 occasions for houses of exceptional quality throughout England. The development will create one of the most innovative and sustainable homes in the country, and it will further the government's latest design and sustainability objectives by assisting in meeting the challenge of climate change through high quality, sustainable design and construction, thereby helping to raise the standards of design more generally. The proposal is sensitive to the defining characteristics of the local area, to the walled garden and it will significantly enhance its setting. Most importantly, the scheme has been the subject of detailed scrutiny and review by your officers, an independent design review body who have fully endorsed the quality of the scheme when assessed against the specific criteria within paragraph 80E of the MPPF. All are agreed that the high bar set by paragraph 80E has not only been met, but has been exceeded in this case. We are also delighted by the level of local support for the scheme, including the Fathersham Society, local residents and Herne Hill Parish Council. There are no objections. We respectfully ask members to grant permission in line with your officer's recommendation for approval, subject to the agreed list of conditions, which will ensure that the benefits of the proposal are delivered. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Hughes. Could I now invite a uh, remotely councillor Valentine to speak on this matter, please, as a ward member? Thank you, Chair. Um, so I think this is uh, uh, an application which I'm, I'm genuinely undecided. Um, we certainly should be of no doubt that if, if this were an ordinary planning application, um, it wouldn't uh, get to see the light of day. It um, convenes uh, all of our uh, policies about homes in the uh, countryside. Um, Staple Street is a is a narrow road um, and wherever you have an access along there really is it's a difficult one. So it all hinges on this paragraph 80 E um, on the national planning policy framework, um, which allows a home if it's uh, truly outstanding, reflecting the highest standards in architecture and would help raise the standards of design more generally in rural areas uh, and would and would in significantly enhance its immediate setting and be sensitive to the defining characters of the local area. Um, 
So certainly the uh, in terms of the uh, energy used in the building, it's it's very much at the leading edge. Is it um, is is it truly outstanding and uh, likely to in, in, uh, improve uh, architecture generally in that respect of energy use? I'm not sure it is. We can already see um, uh, housing for uh, ordinary people, terraced houses that use the interseasonal storage that achieve um, zero carbon or even carbon negative housing. So I fail to see what's in this building that is truly in innovative. As I say, I agree it's leading edge, um, but um, I don't see anything that's genuinely new in it. Uh, despite what the agent has said, when I read the design panel report, there were two when I read the second one, they uh, concluded that the house was not there yet in terms of paragraph ATE. Um, for in terms of the benefit to the public, um, th this scheme would preserve the ancient walled garden um, and that wall on Staple Street is certainly a feature. Um, but the public won't see this, this building. It'll be, it's, it's very um, inconspicuous in the landscape, which of course might well be a good thing, um, but they won't see the building or the um, or the garden, so um, I fail to see what sort of um, benefit for the surrounding area there might be, other than indirectly of the Im improvement in biodiversity we might see in the garden. Um, it seems strange to me to want to preserve the walled uh, garden. So it's the wall along the road, really, is which what people will see, um, and to ex either extend the wall along the uh, western edge. Um, but uh, so it seems strange to me to want to preserve that wall by knocking a hole in it and putting a new entrance in. OK, thank uh, you. Three minutes. OK, thank you. I now move the officer recommendation. Could I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Jays. And as um, again, another ward member, would you wish to actually speak first on this item as part of the committee? Thank you, uh, Chair. <laughs> um, yes, I've um attended the design panel meeting when they were discussing this as well many months ago um i think it's a, a very interesting site uh design um <clears throat> and i think the whole of the wall garden i think is something that that should be pres preserved i think it was uh never actually functional as a garden i understand but it was uh um built just before the the uh, first world war and, and things changed afterwards but i think it's it's still a um, notable site uh, and I think the the, the preservation of, of the uh, site is, is, is a benefit. Um, as far as the entrance goes, um, that is a, a dangerous uh, road. Um, just looking at the crash map that data, there are, are um, things on there. So I think anything that would improve the displays would be worthwhile. So I think I would support the entrance in the uh, proposed site. Um, so I, and the ecological benefits of the design, I think, are, are noteworthy. And I, I from that point of view, I, I will be supporting this. Thank you. Councillor Beard, please. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, members who were here five, six years ago will probably remember when we discussed the um, Sheppey Groundhouse application, which was an application, I think it was actually recommended for refusal but the committee approved it on the basis that it was an outstanding design and we thought that it come under this policy where if it was an outstanding design in the countryside um, that we would accept it and I, I think the officer has got this spot on um, that this is an outstanding design um, we you won't see it it will be hidden behind the wall most people coming along there will see the wall as it stands today and probably be none the wiser that anything has changed apart from the new entrance with the gates. Um, I don't know who the officer was who wrote the report, but I have never seen an officer so enthusiastic for their conclusion, 9.1 and 9.2. Some of the wording in there that the proposal is truly outstanding and reflecting the highest standards of architecture and that it will raise standards of design. I, I'd, I'd, I'd have to conclude that I, I completely agree with the officer and we'll be supporting this. Thank you. Councillor Hunt, please. 
fixture. Um, yeah, I was quite excited when I saw this as well. I went to the um, design review panel as well when it was first looked at, and um, at, at that point, I could see it could be something really good. And what we've got here is something really good. It's it's excellent. Um, I'm pleased to see that that someone is looking at Swell and investing and doing something like this. It says it's the first one that we've had. Um, and I'm, I'm just pleased officers that have brought it to committee and, and haven't just had it delegated and approved it. I'm pleased to see it here um, and hope we have more come forward like this. If people see that this is something that can be done in Swell, we'll um, get some more of them. Thank you. Councillor Dender, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a compliment on the officer. I would say on a very, very thorough report. I had to read about three times, but I got there eventually. Um, but I would point out paragraph 2.3. Um, the agent meant used the word innovative and Councillor Valentine used the word innovative. But apparently in the new paragraph 80E, the word in innovative has been removed as a factor. So innovative doesn't have any bearing on any decision we make. Um, the other thing I'll point out, I think Councillor Valentine picked up on it as well. In paragraph 8.4, um, the agent said it had all been sort of sorted and uh, everybody was satisfied. But in fact, uh, the second paragraph in 8.4 um, disputes that in that the design panel wasn't completely satisfied. Um, maybe the officer can comment on that if there's anything further than that, but I read it that they left it that not everything had satisfied them. Having said that, the conditions have sewn up all the bits that the design panel have referred to. So I'm satisfied that through the conditions it satisfies everything. And yes, I agree with everybody else. It may not be innovative, but it is outstanding. So I will be supporting it. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Winkless, please. Thank you, Chair. I would just like to say I've been reading through the local representations and there was nine um, in support of this, including um, Faversham Town Council and Hearn Hill Council. There's been no objections to this. I'm not going to repeat what the other speakers have said, but uh, I can't see we've got any grounds to turn this down, so I should be supporting the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Jackson. Yes, I grew up in this area and um, I think it's excellent that this is going ahead. And um, as uh, Tony has just, Councillor Winkless has just stated, Faversham Society's for it, Hernhill Parish Council's for it, and I can't see any reason to object to it. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Simmons, please. Thank, thank you, Chairman. I, I said earlier that I, I, I know the, the, the applicants and I, I know the site well, and I had cause to um, to go up Bounds Lane uh, last week, which is to the south, and you from there uh, you you can actually look down on onto uh, the walled garden, and I think this will be a great improvement um, on on the existing, and I think it's just a wonderful way of using something which is a, an architectural feature which is the walled garden uh, and i think this is a great idea and i'm in full support thank you thank you members uh we'll take this one to the vote then please so those in favor of the officer recommendation full house that's unanimous so permission is granted subject to the conditions on the issue of the um, decision notice. Uh, uh, Chairman, uh, we also need the, the strategic mitigation payment, but um, that's in the report at the top of. Yes, of course. Report. Yes, apologies. Uh, subject to that as well, but no, thank you anyway. Good. And uh, congratulations, Mr. Thomas, from me too uh, on your report. Thank you. But, well, it's certainly, uh, not on my, certainly not on my work, so um, thank you anyway. <laughs> Okay, members, uh, can we now move to item 2.4, please? Because we've got a speaker on that one. Um, and that one is 21 oblique 5060, 21 oblique full, which is 21 Chaucer Road, Sittingbourne. And I thank the officer for an outline and any updates, please. Mr. Byrne. 
Thank you, Chairman. Um, no update to give members, so everything is as per the, the report. Um, as a brief um, summary of the application, um, the site is the ground floor takeaway restaurant that members can see in the photo, the Madras Cafe. Um, the site has planning permission for um, operation of a takeaway since 2006. Um, and as members can see, the site forms part of a parade of, of local shops in Chaucer Road um, with separate residential flats above the commercial units. Um, when the 2006 permission was granted, um, a condition was imposed which restricted opening hours to the public and that restriction was until nine o'clock at night, Monday to Saturday and at no time on Sunday. Uh, this application has been submitted to vary the opening hours uh, to allow the unit to open until 10 o'clock at night um, and also to allow the takeaway to open on a Sunday as well. And the key issue here essentially relates to uh, the um, longer open, the, the, the effect of the longer opening hours on residential properties and particularly the, the, the flats above and, and in particular the flat immediately above the, the takeaway itself. Uh, having dis uh, consulted with our environmental health team, uh, they have raised concern about allowing a 10 p.m. opening seven days a week, but consider that it would be acceptable to allow an extension to 10 o'clock on a Friday and Saturday evening. Um, and they also raised no objection to the takeaway opening on a Sunday until eight o'clock in the evening. And, and under these applications, Section 73 applications, the council is entitled to either um, modify a condition as per the application submission or modify it in terms that it finds acceptable or, or alternatively to refuse if, um, if, if the condition shouldn't be altered at all. Um, so um, essentially um, we consider that um, an amended version of the um, opening hours sort is is acceptable. One further point to um, to bring to the attention of members is that whilst the current condition restricts the premises being open to the public um, until nine o'clock, there's no restriction on staff continuing to work within the premises. And some of the concerns and complaints that have been raised by local residents do relate to um, uh, noise and disturbance from from staff. Um, I've recommended um, and you'll see that in the wording of the condition that staff vacate the premises no later than one hour after it is closed to the to the public and we feel that it's reasonable to um, include that um, bearing in mind the additional opening hours that we're minded to to agree to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I now invite Mr. Michael Tamser, please, to speak on this item? Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman. Um, the Chaucer Road Commercial Shopping Parade is a vibrant sector that offers essential services to the surrounding area. As someone who resides in Upton Lane just around the corner, I'm extremely grateful that we have such a range of retail businesses on our doorstep. They include a newsagent, grocery store, cake and coffee shop, car and cycle centre, laundrette, hairdresser, and the three takeaway shops offering fish and chips, Chinese, and the Madras Indian food. Now, policy DM1 of the local plan recognises the importance of maintaining and enhancing the vitality of such centres. Living habits and lifestyles are forever changing. And the recent COVID lockdowns and restrictions have certainly injected fresh impetus into the takeaway food shops with the vast increase in takeaway deliveries. Not only have the retailers and retailers themselves benefited, but it has opened a large number of employment opportunities for people undertaking the deliveries. There's also been a shift over the past couple of decades in the time when people tend to eat. More people are eating later now than ever before. The Madras Cafe seeks to maximise their trade by increasing the opening hours from the approved 11.30 to 9, Monday to Saturday, set in 2006. The environmental health team monitor the opening hours of takeaways and retail units and must make decisions based on the balance between allowing businesses the opportunity to maximise their profits 
whilst protecting the amenities of the neighbouring properties. As such, we respect their view that our proposals to open from 4.30 to 10 seven days a week could be harmful to the amenities of the local residents and accept their proposals of 11.30 to 9 Monday to Thursday, 11.30 to 10 Friday and Saturday and 4.30 to 8 on Sunday. Madras Cafe only recently opened towards the end of last year and it's understood and acknowledged that there have been breaches in planning and noise issues with neighbouring residents to which we offer apologies. Staff having missed their last train home have actually stayed overnight in one of the outbuildings. This has now stopped and I'm ensured by the owner that this practice will no longer be allowed. Notices have recently been displayed requesting all to keep noise to a minimum, especially when leaving the premises and to respect the neighbours. Staff are expected to leave the premises directly after closing on weekdays and within an hour after closing at the weekends. I'm also assured that there are no late night deliveries. All deliveries are made within normal working hours. The Madras needs the additional opening hours to keep the business viable and sustainable. It has acknowledged the justifiable objections raised by local residents regarding the noise and will endeavour to ensure that all noise levels are kept to an absolute minimum. We therefore ask that you support the planning officer in recommending the application for approval. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you very much. So members, I move the officer recommendation. Could have a seconder, please. Councillor Jones, thank you. Councillor Clark, as it's in your ward, would you like to speak first? Um, thank you, Chairman. Yes. Um, since um, this cafe has opened, um, and I do agree with some of what the gentleman has just said, um, with the diversity um, of shops and takeaways in Chaucer Road, um, and indeed I have had a meal from there myself, which was quite delicious. Um, but since they have opened, there have been constant breaches of their current planning permission. Um, I myself have witnessed takeaways being taken out of the front door by delivery drivers up until 11 o'clock at night, um, especially on Fridays and Saturdays. Um, and just to the left, um, you can see in the picture, there's like a little brick built flat roofed outhouse. Um, that was, and I've had it on good authority from residents, is still being used as a residential dwelling for members of staff of that um, particular takeaway. Um, quickly moving on, because I don't want to take up too much time. I have actually received um, a letter from our enforcement team dated the 7th of um, March this year. Um, they are undertaking an investigation into the breaches of planning conditions and the fact that the outhouse is being used as a dwelling. Um, so I plan to say no more on this at the moment, but I would ask and I hope I get a seconder for a deferral of this matter to allow the enforcement team to conduct their um, investigation and report back to us at a future date. Thank you. I would second that, Chair. I'm also local to that area. Thank you, Councillor Dendor. Right, members, you've heard the proposal. Are those in favour? Those against? And abstentions, please. Ten four. Ten four and five against. So um, the item is uh, deferred. Thank you, members. Can I now bring you on to item um, two point five, please? And this one is um, two one oblique five zero six three five seven oblique full. And it's 116 Oak Lane, Upchurch, Kent. And I thank the officer for uh, an outline and any updates, please. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, no updates to give members. If you can just bear with me whilst I bring a drawing up. OK, 
So um, this application is seeking a temporary permission for the use of um, two garages that are part of a development on this wider site uh, for residential accommodation. Um, essentially, permission's been granted for the two dwellings with garages. Um, they are being built as self-built projects and the owners of the two plots are seeking to occupy the garages um, whilst the, the building work is undertaken. And if I show members a photograph, you'll see that the garages have already been built and are in the background there. And at the time this photo was taken, the, um, the walls of the, the two dwellings are, are being constructed. Um, the temporary permission that's sought is for a year um, and members will note from the uh, committee report and the condition that uh, uh, there is a condition that states that the permission only runs for a year or um, at a point when the dwellings are first occupied, which whichever is the sooner of the two. Uh, officers consider that um, while slightly unusual, this is appropriate. Um, there are other options that um, aren't uncommon, uh, uncommon um, with um, uh, caravans being brought onto construction sites um, to be occupied. Um, sometimes that doesn't need planning permission in itself. Um, and we consider that actually utilising one of the buildings that will form um, part of the, the, the final development for this purpose is, is, is a better option. Um, and of course, when the, um, when the permission lapses, uh, the buildings will revert to garages with accommodation above as per the, the planning permission that's been granted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could I invite um, Parish Councillor uh, Gary, Rose, Gary Rosewell, please, to speak on this item? And I understand you're speaking remotely, Gary. Unfortunately, it appears that uh, Councillor Rosewell hasn't joined the meeting um, remotely. So um, I'd now invite the ward member um, to speak, Councillor Palmer, on this item, please. Thank you, Chair. I do feel this is an awkward one because local residents don't seem to have an objection, but the Parish Council have. However, I do understand why the Parish Council has concerns because there's a t Section 278 notice uh, in agreement uh, agreement in relation to the planning permission granted and basically it says no dwelling shall be occupied until the highway highway works indicated in the join have been completed and it just seems strange that you can then form a dwelling of a garage and live on site but i can understand we're trying to support people who are doing a self-build and these are self-builders so i think there's a difficult decision but i do feel that when it says no dwelling, it does mean no dwelling. And that's my, that's my only point, and I think that's what the Parish Council would like to put across as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, I move the officer recommendation. Could I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Jays. Members, anybody wish to speak? Councillor Winkless. Thank you, Chair. Um, in principle, I'm not actually against um, the garage is being used on a one year temporary basis for the uh, reasons that have been outlined. But I will support this on the understanding that it is only temporary for one year. And uh, what concerns me a little bit is if it's uh, if the temporary gets extended, but I will support it on the grounds of what is stated here for a one year temporary. Thank you. Councillor Hunt, please. Thanks, Chair. I, swear, I did find this a bit strange where we agree that some work, highway work, needs to be done before occupation, and then we turn around and say, well, someone can live on the site anyway without it. Um, but I do understand the situation where you could put two caravans on the site and have those people coming in and out in cars um, in a situation where we, we haven't got highways work. So um, I don't think there's any any way that we could refuse it, but I can see that it would uh, make sense for them to, to use the garages as they've been built. Thank you. Councillor Martin, please. 
Yeah, though I understand where the parish council has come from, we have to look at what has changed and uh, the aspect that has changed realistically when this was last put before committee, it was for two dwellings by a developer. Now it's two self build plots. We generally have a lack of self build plots within the borough anyway. Um, let's face it, if you're on site self building, you're looking to save as much penny, as many pennies as you can to complete as quick as you can. If this aids that and therefore means that those uh, highways works get done a little quicker as well because they're saving those pennies, not paying rent. Perfectly valid, makes complete sense. Fully agree with the officer. Thank you. Right, members, we go to the vote on it. Oh, sorry, Councillor Marchington, apologies. Thank you, Chair. Just quite clear it. Um, since we're going to be living in the garages, can we just have the uh, arrangement of toilet and washing facilities at this location space? Yes. Mr. Byrne, could you help us with that? Yeah, I'll show you the um, the elevations and the floor plans. Just zoom in a bit for you. So if members can see there, they have installed a, um, a shower room um, and there'll be a temporary kitchen um, that is proposed within the building as well that can be used. Excuse me, is that in the building or in the garage? That's within the garage, yeah. And I'll take it they would be removed after the temporary Yeah, they would go back to the um, the layout of the um, building that was approved under the original permission, which I don't have the plan in front of me, but I'm assuming that, you know, that on the ground floor, that will be simply garage parking spaces. Okay. Yeah, you don't get too many kitchens in garages. No, so. Not very often. <laughs> Unless they've been stored. <laughs> OK, members, right, I'll put this one to the vote then. Oh, sorry, Councillor Hall. Uh, just wondering um, how many persons will be living in these uh, garages? Well, they're only, they're only one bed units, so um, uh, we would assume that um, it's likely to be the, um, I would imagine, the owners that are carrying out the, the work and, and possibly their, their, their immediate partner, but um, that would be that would be it. They're only one bed units. There's not. Well, we don't we don't generally. Well, I mean, we don't obviously, you know, this is this is different insofar as it is a temporary permission for a very specific purpose connected to the to the self build and um, in planning terms, um, you know, we can't we, we we don't generally sort of control or question how many people may may live in a property. But this has been made on the basis that a um, a person who has bought these plots or two people that bought these plots to build and are taking part in the process as part of the self build process are going to occupy these units whilst they do that. OK, thank you. Right, members, we'll take this one to the vote then, please. Those in favour of the recommendation? Those against? Abstentions? Two. That's 14 four and two abstentions. So uh, temporary permission is granted, subject to the issue of the decision notice. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move on to item uh, two six. And this one is um, two two oblique five zero zero two eight nine oblique full. And it's 115 Park Road, Sittingbourne. And again, I'll thank Mr. Byrne for an outline and any updates, please. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, do have some updates for members. Um, I just prefer them to the tabled update. They'll see that there are some comments from the Environmental Health Officer um, who essentially raises no objection to the application. Uh, there is an additional representation from an immediate neighbour and there are some further supporting comments from the applicant and I understand those have also been circulated separately to, to members as well. Um, in terms of the background, um, you, you may have to bear with me on this. Um, the, the, the application is to the application is to convert the premises to a seven bed house in multiple occupation or HMO as we abbreviate it. 
and to erect a, a dormer window to the property. Um, and the property um, was formerly uh, a single dwelling. Um, these plans, which probably can't see in too much detail, show, show the layout, but essentially there are um, uh, three bedrooms at ground floor level, um, all of which have an ensuite. There is a, a living area and a kitchen here. Um, and then at first floor level, we have three further bedrooms and a bedroom in the in the loft. And as part of the proposal, a dormer window is to be erected on the rear elevation of the building, as you can see here. Now, this application, an identical application essentially was submitted to the council last year and the council refused planning permission and it refused permission on the basis that um, it considered that the proposal intensified the, the, the use and activity um, in and around the site to, to an unacceptable degree and to the detriment of neighbours um, and that um, it would um, also increase parking demand and that the design of the dormer window was contrary to the the council's guidance um, on dormers and was of a scale and design that was that was unacceptable. Um, and that application is currently at appeal um, and under consideration at appeal. Um, following that refusal, the applicant submitted an, um, an application for lawful development certificate, which was to convert the property into a six person HMO and to erect a dormer window on the rear of the building under permitted development. And as members will see from this drawing, if I toggle between the two, you'll see that this is the this is the application that was subject to the lawful development certificate. This is what we now have in front of us and you can see it's it's absolutely identical. Now um, the conversion of a dwelling into a HMO of up to six bedrooms is permitted development and it was also established through the lawful development certificate that the dormer window proposed um, was also permitted development. So the applicant has now come back with the current application which is externally exactly the same as the, um, the scheme that benefits from a lawful development certificate. Internally, um, they're proposing to add one additional uh, room, um, so it will become a, a, a seven bed HMO. And if I just show you the floor plan, what they're doing is at first floor level, um, where I've shown you, there's the, that's, there's, that's essentially the seventh um, bedroom and under the application for lawful development certificate that was shown as a second lounge to the to the HMO. So we're, we're in a different position now to where we were with the first application insofar as the applicant has a fallback position that they can convert the premises to a six bed HMO and direct the dormer window without the need for planning permission and that basis hadn't been established when we dealt with the, the first application for planning permission. So in practical terms we're really looking at the difference between a six person HMO and a seven person HMO. And there is um, there is some appeal um, precedents um, around the country where that has been considered and where inspectors have taken the view that the difference in activity between the two is very little and not sufficient to be able to um, demonstrate that um, the increase is demonstrably harmful and that's essentially where we are here. We consider that um, they do have an established fallback now and a seven bed HMO would not be demonstrably harmful compared to that. The dormer window would be identical um, and members will also know. The one thing I would just say to members is members will see um, we are proposing a condition um, which is condition da, 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 six, which requires that no more than seven residents can occupy the HMO. That's been used on other um, 
uh, appeal in other appeal decisions elsewhere, inspectors have used that condition. So we consider that it, it meets the test and is it acceptable and reasonable as a condition in this instance. And the applicant is happy to accept that. Thank you. Thank you. To I invite Mr. Andrew Newsom, please, to speak on this item. I understand you're speaking remotely, Mr. Newsom. Uh, yeah, I think you're muted, Mr. Newsom, at the minute. Could you try to speak again, please, Mr. Newsom? Hello, Chairman, it's Kelly. I have Mr. Newsom's speech, if you wanted me to read it out. Would you be happy with um, our Democratic Service Officer reading out your speech, Mr. Newsom? If you, you are, please just give us a little thumbs up. Oh, thumbs up, you want to, okay. But I will try to get you in. Unfortunately, it's not allowing me to unmute him, so. Okay, Mr. Newsom, we'll proceed with it. Thank you very much indeed. And apologies for the issues around the, the IT. Um, Kelly, could you read Mr. Newton's uh, speech, please? Yes, of course. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you. I was shocked to read within the agenda reports pack that the planning department have reversed their opinion on this planning application and are now recommending approval of this application when there has been absolutely no material change to the previously rejected application. I condensed the reasoning to a seven bed HMO is only a little bit worse than a six bed HMO, which is apparently a lawful development. As experts in their field, I can only assume the planners would have considered this in their initial decision. The only conclusion that I can now draw is that in the face of a challenging appeal, the planning department do not wish to take a risk on the costs of defending their initial decision. I question the whole integrity of this process. Planning permission is required for a seven bed HMO, but not for a six bed HMO. But it appears that the default position is to accept that a seven bed HMO is only a little bit worse than a six bed HMO. Why then is there a planning requirement in the first place? Surely it is to assess whether the property and location is really sustainable for such intense development. And in this case, the answer is no, as the planning department supported in their initial decision. Following a similar argument, it also appears that because a seven bed HMO is just a little bit worse than a six bed HMO, then planning guidelines with respect to parking provision and that the property being of an adequate size in the first place may also be disregarded. As residents, we will suffer a loss of amenity through loss of parking availability and increased general disturbance from the comings and goings associated with a six bed HMO as opposed to a family dwelling. There is no justification in saying it will only be a little bit worse with a seven bed HMO. Where does it stop? Regarding the parking, please examine, examine fig, figure one and two photos taken from my property at 7.15 p.m. on the 8th of March, 2022, looking up and down Park Road outside zone controlled hours. Please explain 
where the residents and visitors of 115 Park Road are going to park. Every single additional independent person who lives in the road will increase the demand. The location is completely unsustainable from a parking position and this load can be minimised by rejecting the application for a seven bed HMO. If the area were truly sustainable as suggested in the application because of its closeness to transport links, shops etc, then we would not see so many cars already. It is noted in the application that one of the conditions that could be applied is that there would be a maximum of seven occupants. I accept that the landlord could limit to seven individual tenancy agreements, but in practice how are occupants actually defined? If a tenant has an overnight visitor, say six nights of the week, this will exacerbate the problem and will be difficult to control. If permission is granted, it sets a precedent for further developments of a similar nature. So, thank you very much. Sorry, I got. Is that time? Yeah, yeah. How much have you got left? <laughs> one, one sentence or? No, a couple of paragraphs. Right, OK, uh, we'll have to draw the line then, unfortunately. Thank you. I move the officer recommendation. We could have a second, please. Councillor Jays, thank you. Uh, Councillor Clark, this one falls in your award again. Would you like to speak first on it? Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, my first comment is I have to agree with everything that was in Mr Newson's um, statement that was read out. Um, when this first came um, to my attention last year, um, I spoke to Mr Byrne um, with regards to it um, and was then informed obviously that the, the planning officers were going to refuse it. Um, and then I was quite flabbergasted when, well, within weeks, um, it came back um, for a lawful development certificate. Um, as has been stated, this this area is predominantly um, two storey family dwellings um, and I see absolutely no need for any of those convert any of those properties to be converted into HMOs. There are some properties in Park Road that have, can be, have been converted into two one or two bedroom flats. Um, which is entirely different, but I would um, say that we're not um, a large university town. We don't have large hospitals um, which would necessitate possibly HMOs. Um, so therefore I, I, I have problems with this. I mean, I, I will have to vote against it. Um, I would rather obviously see this, um, you know, remain as a as a family dwelling. Um, and just as a side, I did actually bump into the previous owner of this property um, a few weeks ago um, and was having a chat with her. And she said that um, they, the uh, the people that were actually buying it from her had actually put in the planning application for the seven bed HMO before they'd even signed the contract, <laughs> which is a little bit. Um, contrary. Um, but anyway, as I say, I, I, I have to vote against this one. I don't see the necessity for it to go uh, into a HMO. Um, the only thing I would ask, um, I would ask members to turn this down, but I can see that perhaps, you know, as Mr Burns said, we, we may have problems if it does go through with the appeal. Um, but I would ask that and I, I, I stand to be corrected on this, um, in the conditions, could we have a condition put in there that is, as it is in a resident parking area, um, that's only two parking permits for that building are issued as per all other dwellings within the parking permit area. Um, otherwise we will have seven parking permits, which is a possible 14 cars, um, so I stand to be corrected whether that can be a condition or not, but if if possible, I would like to see that condition put in. Thank you, Chairman. 
Okay, Mr. Byrne, is that something that we should do? Um, my understanding is it's not, I'm afraid. Um, it's a okay. uh, matter that's dealt with Thank you. Um, under separate legislation. Thank you very much. Councillor Hunt, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, listening to the objector there, I think it's understandable um, where you have something that's refused and then there's uh, permitted development rights that can allow it and then we're looking at approving it when um, something's been refused in the past but if you ever try and work the planning system out you'd be there for years trying to work that one out um, but we are in a situation where obviously six is allowed um, and while it's a, a complicated case I think it is also pretty straightforward it's does the one extra person at that property going to cause any demonstrable harm that uh, gives us a reason to refuse it? And I think the answer is unfortunately no. Thank you. Councillor Winkless, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, can the officer put a, um, a photograph up of the, of the property, uh, the obviously outside of it? So which one are we talking about there? This property here, where I'm popping my mouse over. That one there. And at the moment, what is it? Is it how many rooms is there in, in there at the moment? I believe it's a four bed house. Four bed. Yeah, there's one at the back here in the single story extension and three upstairs. Out of a post is to a seven. Oh, I do have some concerns on this. Obviously, the, uh, the fire service have obviously passed it or haven't objected. But um, I have concerns that, uh, as you, you rightly said, there might be over. You know, Two people, what we have, what, basically a maximum of 14 people there um, getting at the emergency. So I have some concerns. That I'll listen to the rest, rest of the debate before I make my mind up. Thank you. Councillor Dender, please. Thank you, Chair. I think we've got to be clear here, as Councillor Hunt says, we are not voting on six or seven, we are voting on one. Um, it's a done deal. The six are going ahead, the rear dormer is going ahead. I'm curious. A, how did that property get PDR? And B, how many properties in the uh, around there also could qualify for PDR? So that might be something you want to answer. Well, well essentially every residential dwelling has permitted development rights unless they're um, expressly removed by the um, by the council, um, and those rights are national rights that obviously derive from the government. I, I was ask, I, I was aware of that. I was asking for your clarification so that the resident could hear it. Um, when these were built all those years ago, as you say, the PDR was a given. It's a given unless it's taken away. Um, and that's always the issue, which is why in modern developments we ought to always try to have the PDR removed. Um, but yeah, we are only voting on the one. Um, on the question of 14 parking spaces, I think you referred earlier, there is a condition saying that only one person in each of the uh, bedrooms. So it's actually seven people. It remains to see if that can be enforced, but theoretically it's actually seven, not 14. Um, and like Councillor Hunt, I think just on the basis of one extra I think it's going to be very tricky on appeal if we turned it down. So regretfully, I'm afraid I'll have to go for it. Thanks to vote for the officer. Thank you. Councillor Simmons, please. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Well, I have the contrary view because whilst it may only be one extra, it is 16% more uh, occupation. And I, I, I just think that um, I, I cannot understand why someone would want to have one more person in an HMO. Um, 
councillor councillor um or two uh, councillor martin no doubt has has some experience of of uh the conditions within hmos and and i just think uh it's it's a sign of greed on behalf of the applicant to squeeze another extra person in and i think it's unacceptable i'm going to vote against it on on principle that they've got permitted development for six when they've been greedy in asking for a seventh thank you very much councillor gold please thank you um i think i'm going to be uh voting in, in favor on the grounds that the you know the, the appeal um <coughs> vulnerability uh, i think is is a, a material fact there one thing i was wondering i noticed that the um cycle parking is just for four cycles in a cycle in a cycle rack i was wondering whether we could amend that condition to be seven cycles in a lockable covered um, cycle store so that actually it was actually more likely that people would be willing to use the bike and actually have it available safe and not rusting because it's out the rain um and therefore whether that would be something towards um mitigating the uh the, the parking side of things thank you mr Byrne. is that something that's doable yeah of course um you know members um are entitled to um consider whether that condition um needs to be amended at the moment it's wrapped up with a a, a bin it's a bin and cycle storage condition but if members wanted those separated out and the requirement for um cycle storage to be provided on the basis of um uh one cycle storage space per per hmo bedroom then yeah that's fine and i think it would, i would want it to see as as not, not just a rack which is but actually to be a lockable covered um site as well um store as well members you're all happy with that as a amendment okay thank you and now we've got Councillor Martin, please. I certainly understand where the residents are coming from on this one, and, and Councillor Simmons is correct to use the word greed. I mean, we're talking about essentially for the extra bedroom an extra hundred pound a week. Um, however, condition six limits it to seven residents. What we're actually discussing, it's not just one extra bedroom. It could in theory be uh, four less people. If you've got uh, six all couples versus if you've got seven all individuals. That's made fairly clear in my interpretation of condition six that you're not going to get 14. You're not going to get 12. You're going to get seven. The fallback position is they can have 12 people in there. Essentially, it's a choice between something that we can condition, which we can demonstrate could be less harmful or something we can't condition and they just end up with the six and then probably beating us at appeal on the current one. Um, and let's face it, they'll be able to argue that we haven't been particularly reasonable at this meeting if we uh, don't go with the officers on it. So I will be supporting the officers uh, regretfully. Yeah, Mr Byrne, please. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. If I can just clarify a, a, a couple of things, just just in response to, to Councillor Martin, the um, uh, the, the, the lawfulness of being able to change under permitted development from a dwelling to a HMO is based on it being a six person HMO. So um, I think it's probably arguable then that if more than six people occupied it, it would take it into territory where it would need planning permission as a change of use. Um, in terms of Councillor Winkless and your concerns about fire safety, um, that's dealt with separately from, from planning. Um, it's normally a matter that falls under um, building regulations or um, I know with larger HMOs there's a requirement for those to be licensed yeah so um, there's other regimes that um, uh, are involved um, in this as well rather than just planning thank you thank you I'm going to let Councillor Clark come back quickly <clears throat> um, yeah just a brief question really chairman I think it's partially been answered um, I wonder if Mr Byrne could actually explain how um, HMOs are actually licensed once they're, they've got their permission um, and also um, as a HMO and you said before Mr Byrne it probably comes under building regulations and again you chairman um, being an ex-fire service um, would it require a separate um, fire escape thank you 
Um, the, the, the quick answer is I can't give you any real detail on the licensing requirements because that's done by our specific licensing team. So that's a different area to, to, to planning. The licensing team did comment on the application and I'm just trying to find the, the relevant section. Um, of, uh, Yeah, thank you. Um, so the, the the housing team, who, as I understand it, will will carry out the um, uh, the work on the license, um, have um, had a look at the the planning application and haven't identified any any specific issues there that um, would give them cause for concern. And I would assume that if there was an an, an element that cause them a problem for licensing purposes, they may well have highlighted that to us at this stage um, if it was relevant to, to how we deal with the planning application. Thank you. Thank you very much, members. I'm going to take this one to the vote now then, please. Those in favour of the officer recommendation? Uh, yes, uh, with the conditions and as amended. Those against? And abstentions. So that's nine, four and six against. So permission is granted subject to the issuing of the decision notice. Members at this point, um, I'm just going to adjourn. Sorry. I do apologize. Didn't didn't see his hand. That's not me. I was a good try, but but this this is um it's taking those. No, thank you. Uh, put your hand up at all. Okay, members, I'm just going to adjourn um, for a comfort break for uh, five minutes, and uh, when we come back, we'll be moving on to item two seven. <laughs>
Okay, members, um, we'll reconvene the meeting. Um, I'm reconvening with item 2.7, uh, which is 19 oblique 505 263 oblique full, and it's Keynes Farm, Breach Lane, Upchurch. And I'll thank you, sir, for uh, outlining any updates. Please, Mr. Byrne. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, there is a tabled update. Um, if I can draw members' attention to that, um, essentially, um, our recommendation is that a further planning condition is added to achieve appropriate visibility displays um, to the to the access. Um, in terms of the application itself, um, this is the site location plan. You can see the, the the site in question, which is in the red line as usual. It's on the the west side of Breach Lane, and you can just see in the corner here. Here's the the A2. Um, and um, you have the, the railway, which um, at this point um, runs on a, a, an embankment. Um, and op on the opposite side of Breach Lane, you have a vehicle repair garage, which is here. Um, but otherwise, the site is and, and surrounding area is essentially um, open and, and rural in character. A number of, of <coughs> these small uh, fields here are, are paddocks. Um, members can also see that there's an existing stable building on the on the site. The application is to retain a port cabin that has been stationed on the site as residential accommodation. And the um, the application has essentially been made or the justification for this has essentially been made on two grounds. Um, firstly, that the um, there is an agricultural need for uh, residential occupation in association with the operation of a small holding, um, which takes place partially within the stables and partially beyond those stables. Um, and secondly, um, that the applicant identifies as coming from a, a gypsy and traveller background. Um, and although he no longer travels due to age and um, freely accepts that and, and therefore falls outside of the, the, the standard definition for, for a gypsy, which is within the government's planning policy and traveller sites um, document, um, he is non nonetheless a um, um, what we would, I suppose, call a, a, a cultural gypsy. Um, it um, just shows some photographs of the site. So this is the porter cabin. Um, it's been in place since 2017 and he's occupied the site since 2017. This is the site from a little distance. You can see the porter cabin just here. It sits behind a fairly decent hedge along the boundary with Breach Lane. You've got the stable building, which is here, the dark building, and then there's some structures to the rear, which are identified in, on the plans as a, as a piggery. Um, they've, the applicant has also installed this um, fencing. Uh, this area here is all under two metres in height and therefore qualifies as, as permitted development and doesn't in itself need, need planning permission. Um, so in terms of their justification, um, members will see from the, the main report that the agricultural need has been assessed and we've taken advice from the council's agricultural consultant and um, we've concluded that there isn't a, an essential need to live on site on agricultural grounds. Um, in terms of gypsy status, the, the application includes information on the the nomadic background that the applicant followed and his gypsy and traveller heritage. Um, but as I said earlier, he, he accepts he no longer travels, um, which is due to age. He's, I think, now 80 or nearly 80. And on this basis, he doesn't meet the definition in the PPTS document that I referred to earlier. And, and he's certainly not arguing that he, that he follows a, a, a travelling lifestyle now. Um, but it, the issue we have is that the applicant falls 
within within a group that we ref we're referring to as as cultural gypsies um, who identify as being of gypsy heritage but but no longer travel or follow a nomadic lifestyle um, and our own gypsy and traveler accommodation assessment does recognize that um, there is a um, a group um, that um, uh, that exists under this definition um, and that there is a, a need um, an identified need within the gypsy and traveler assessment um, for um, uh, additional pitches required for for, for this group and um, some members may be aware of a, a, a similar situation arose with a site um, at Grace's place in Doddington um, which is referred to in the report and where a, um, an inspector fully acknowledged that uh, a family um, were of gypsy heritage but no longer travelled um, and that there was a, an outstanding need in our gypsy and traveller assessment um, for that sector um, and, um, and granted a temporary and personal permission on appeal. Um, and, and, and it comes down to the fact that um, you know, the, council, the council is generally required to address housing needs of, of various different groups and um, the difficulty here is that our, our gypsy policy DM10 um, only applies to gypsies that meet the, the PPTS definition. So if, if you are a cultural gypsy and you don't travel anymore, you don't meet that definition um, and the policy um, is not um, material to the application. But we have no, no policy um, that does meet um, this group of, of cultural gypsies. Um, and in terms of the site itself, um, as you can see from the, the photos, it is essentially very much rural in character and not in a location where development would, would normally be permitted. Um, but having said that, the porter cabin is, is reasonably well screened from the, from the road and the railway embankment as well offers, offers screening. And whilst we don't consider it suitable as a, as a permanent site, um, we consider in this instance that the, the balance falls in favour of granting a, a temporary and personal planning permission um, in light of this identified need that isn't currently currently being met by the council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could I invite um, Parish Councilor Gary Rosewell? Is he with us yet or? You know, I've just had an email, Mr Chairman. Um, he, he is still online apparently and he was online when you um, called him for 2.5 as well. Hello Chairman, I, I can confirm that he, he isn't in the meeting. I have asked if he can forward his statement, um, but as you can see, he's he's not showing as being in attendance online. Yeah. Councillor Beard, please. From the email that Councillor Rosewell has sent us, he's been sent the link to the live event not to be a presenter, so he hasn't been invited to come in as a speaker. He's, he's only able to view the meeting, he's not able to speak. Uh, once again, we seem to have fallen, fallen down on IT. He was sent the same link as all members. Perhaps it's a device issue, I know if you, as we're I, told, I on laptops. Right OK, I, well, I don't think we're going to um, be able to progress that any further, um, unfortunately. Um, so now can I invite Mr Michael Tamza, please, to speak on this issue. Good evening once again, Mr Seeker. Um, the applicant took over the site in March 2017 and started to build up a small holding business breeding pigs and chicken. Following a spate of crime activity, he moved on to the site in November 2017 to live and to keep the site secure. He has led a nomadic life site since birth. Coming from a gypsy family, he married a traveller and his daughter has followed suit and has also married a traveller. So the whole family is, is of that origin. He has around 60 years of experience working on different farms throughout his traveling life and the breeding of pigs has become his passion. 
He cu currently has 50 farrowing pigs, approximately 100 chicken, 30 ducks and 30 geese to look after on the land and raise around 50 turkeys for the Christmas period. In addition to the small holding, there's an approved equine use on the land. There are five stables on site. Three stables are rented out. A stallion of his is kept in one and the other is currently vacant, but will hopefully be rented out in due course. The agriculture advisor has concluded that the level of activity and production does not meet the usual tests of essential agricultural needs for on-site accommodation. However, the applicant is self-sufficient and the income from his ventures has proved viable and provides him with a comfortable, sustainable living. The applicant is making good farming use of the site, albeit on a small scale. In relation to the impact of the porter cabin currently being resided in by the applicant, it is, the least, it is in the least conspicuous location within the corner of the site with a large vehicle repair building immediately to the east side of Breach Lane and the railway line and embankment to the south. There is also an existing hedge along Breach Lane that further screens the building. The current port cabin structure has a poor appearance and should the applicant be permitted to reside on site, it is proposed to replace this with a more appropriate enhanced looking mobile home. The site is remote from any residential is remote from any res residential dwellings and the planning officer was satisfied that the pro proposal was acceptable on amenity grounds. It should be noted that the fencing panels referred to in the planning officer's report under the recommended condition six have already been removed for highway safety reasons and the SAMS payment of 253.83 has already been paid. This is an unusual scenario of a lifetime traveller wishing to spend the remainder of his life running a small holding to keep himself self-sufficient. There is a humane aspect here under the Human Rights Act 1998. There should be respect for private life and home, and this should be a measured consideration. The conditions set out by the planning officer appear to, commensurate, to be commensurate with allowing a cultural gypsy the right to reside whilst respecting the long-term character and appearance of the site with the temporary note. We therefore ask that you support the planning officer in recommending approval of the application. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could I now invite visiting member Councillor Palmer as a ward member to speak on this item, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. I don't dispute what's in the officer's report and what the officer's just, just told the committee. I don't dispute the fact that the applicant is a, a, a gypsy and traveller. What I do dispute and what I think is a letdown is that there's no evidence that he actually fits the traveller's the gypsy status as defined in the national planning policy framework. Uh, is this council just going to accept someone who says, well, 55 years ago I did this and 55 years ago I did that? I don't think that's acceptable. And even Mark Wallace QC and Chris Johnson, who wrote the, the well-known book, Gypsy and Traveller Law, actually advises travellers, gypsy and travellers, to prove their traveller status. And I don't think this has been proved in this case. And I feel that without that evidence that this committee can't make that, that assumption that he fits that legal status of a of gypsy status. It's interesting that he went onto the land in 2017, but there was no application until 2018 because it had to be retrospective. He then stayed on the land and again, has applied for planning permission and then for what I feel is we, he will come up with his gypsy status. However, it doesn't meet or there is no evidence shown in the report. I, don't, I think the report is fair and accurate with what's been provided, but the planning statement has not provided sufficient evidence of his gypsy status and that should fall. And then all you've got to consider is, is it a agricultural with residential? And again, there's claims of theft, but there's no evidence of crime numbers. So what seems to be lacking is evidence. And this committee should either defer this and ask for evidence or assess it as an agricultural residential building and refuse it in my view. I do, I do feel that the conditions that have been applied, because particularly condition five, are, are a good, sound and reasonable conditions. It is one area that I've received a lot of complaints from local residents over some of the activities that have gone there and the fear that they don't want to actually put written representations in. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I now move the officer recommendation. Do a second, please. Councillor Jez, thank you. Councillor Clark, please. Or were you just signalling no, to the Sorry, Chair. It was just I was indicating ah, about the um, email I've received. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hunt. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think it might be good just to have a, a bit of a clarification on the gypsy status. On in two point four, um, it says that the try and find the word in in respect of the the applicant being a gypsy traveller status, it says that the application includes information. The applicant comes from a gypsy traveller background. So I guess officers have looked at that point um, that this is so it'd be good to if we do know about what detail that information is. And I, I think it we need to look at this. Obviously, the five year we, we shouldn't actually be in the position now um, to, to be having to do this for another five years. But as is shown in 8.7, the, the only reason we're doing this is because we haven't got our act together with the, the local plan and been able to sort this out. And if we were in a better position with that, we'd be in a position to be able to, to refuse this. Um, but we're, we're in no option. I don't see that uh, we should allow this for another five years. Councillor Dender, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, I like Councillor Hunt, I'm minded to let this through, but I have got a question on some of the objections that are mentioned, um, which if I remember, and I'm trying to find them now, uh, was fire tipping, waste, uh, noise of uh, motorbikes and fires. But I note in the conditions, I don't know if we can condition any of this, apart from waste, which is mentioned in one of them, uh, the other two are not covered in any way. Is there any way on conditions that we can cover this and uh, can we enforce them? Mr Byrne, could you help us? Yeah, I mean issues relating to, for example, um, fires. Um, I mean that, that would that would fall under the Environmental Protection Act, so it would be dealt with by our environmental health team as a, as a nuisance. Um, I think the difficulty is that in planning terms, what we're looking at is, 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 it, is it acceptable to grant planning permission for residential use of the site? And, and in that respect, in many ways, you, you know, you're looking at a residential use in, in a way, in the same way as if it was a, a new dwelling. And would somebody, you know, would somebody, um, would we put a condition down that stops somebody from lighting a fire in their rear garden under under a application for planning permission for a new dwelling? I don't think it's not something that I believe is best controlled under planning um, legislation because environmental protection acts are there to deal with that. It's dealt with under different legislation, so we would expect that to be to be dealt with that way. If I could just come back, quickly. yes. Um, my concern, as the objector says there. Um, but I, I take your point, and it may also be environmental protection, is its proximity to the railway. And if it's not just fires, but bonfires, massive fires, which it probably is, is the smoke drifting over the railway. That 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 really is the concern, I think, there. Um, and then noise, of course, is another issue. But again, you may say that's under, also under environmental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, that would be my answer, yeah. Thank you. Councillor Gold, please. Thank you. Um, my, my question uh, concerns about the uh, viability criteria uh, of the, um, <coughs> the the farming activities that are taking place uh, on site. Um, I mean, it strikes me if, if the um, activity is enough to maintain it, you know, to keep him in a living, that to my view would, would count as a, as, a, as a viable um business and i just wonder really whether uh that that is is something that you know whether whether there is a definition of, of what a viable business means given that people's requirements for a um you know may be quite limited and, and modest and therefore if you can make a living that's sufficient for your needs why is that not a viable business 
Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the test that's applied um, in relation to what we would um, consider as a um, agricultural d dwelling as such, or, or in this instance, uh, uh, a, a mobile unit related to, to an agricultural holding, the, the bar is pretty high there. Um, and essentially what the council is considering is, is there, is there an essential need for somebody to reside on the land um, uh, on a continuous basis? Um, and, um, and is the business um, viable um, as, a, as, a, as an agricultural business? And the two have to be considered hand in hand, essentially. Um, to determine whether or not um, a scheme is is acceptable or not, and of course the bar is quite high because um, it, ne it needs to be high to essentially, you know, sort of stop, I suppose, you know, hobby farmers from being able to take on very small plots of land and um, and justify a dwelling on that basis. We we obviously we take advice from our agricultural advisor, who who is the expert. Um, in these matters and he has looked at this carefully and has taken the view that the applicant doesn't meet the bar um, on either test um, and, and hence you know, that's we have reported his comments and that's our you know we agree with that and that's our position on it. Thank you. Member Beer, please. Yeah thank you chairman. Um, I, I'm deeply divided on this one. Um, the, the applicant, I, I will take him on his word that he's been a traveller his entire life. He's got to 80, doesn't want to travel anymore, wants to settle down and live his last golden years somewhere. And I think that's completely acceptable and you can understand that. Um, in my experience, what usually happens is these temporary personal permissions get given. Five years on, they apply to make them permanent when they come to their natural end we tend to refuse them. They go to the planning inspector and the inspector approves them. Um, I, I've seen that plenty of times in my time on this committee. Um, I, I also wonder about the condition, the permission shall extend to a maximum of five years or the lifetime of the applicant, whichever is shorter. Now, our justification is that the applicant is 80 and wants to settle down on this land. In five years time, he's going to be 85 realistically he's not going to be wanting to move on from this land so we're actually looking at a personal permission that could last a lot longer than five years and will probably come back to us um so so i i'm still not sure how i'm going to vote no, nothing in the debate so far has swayed me one way or the other um from that picture i don't think it has a huge impact on the surrounding area um but things change over time um, so, so I'm, I'm still unsure. Thank you. Members, anybody else before we go to the vote on this one? Uh, Councillor Marchington, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Can we put in the condition just, just that it's uh, just that occupant only? Like, like yeah, that's already in there in the condition. Yeah. Yeah, that's OK. OK, members, we'll take this one to the vote then. Uh, Sorry. Yes, apologies. Just before we go to the voting, there was a question uh, about um, clarification of gypsy status. Um, yes. I said that in, in the report, it does say that information was given. I, I assume that officers have looked at that and. Been... Yeah, so, so um, the the um, supporting statement that was submitted with the application um, sets out a, a number of points relating to the the backgrounds um, to the applicant and the fact that he comes from a nomadic background, his family um, were all travellers, um, he has daughters that have married into other travellers, he himself has um, married other traveller families and then, that, uh, sorry, a, a, a person from another traveller family. Um, and um, he then provides some information about um, how he had historically travelled from farm to farm. Um, he um, 
mentions a number of farms um, in Kent um, and uh, more locally in Raynham. Uh, and, uh, uh, and and essentially some, yeah, there's some more information then about uh, the fact that he had split up with his wife um, shortly before moving on to, to, to this site. But from the information that's been provided, um, we're, we're happy and we certainly have nothing to contradict what has been what has been set out in the application. OK, thank you. So members, those in favour of the officer recommendation? Those against? And abstentions? That's 15-4 and one abstention, so permission is granted subject to the issue of the decision notice and uh, appropriate conditions. Thank you. I understand the SAMS payment's already been made. OK, members, if we can bring you back to item 2-2, please. And this one is 2-1 oblique 506-401 oblique full. And it's New Barns, Farm Box Lane, Painters Forstall. And uh, I thank Arosa for um, an outline and any updates, please. Yeah, good evening again. Um, if, um, if Andy can clear his screen, I'll, I'll share mine. Um, the, there isn't any real update in terms of the application, thank you. Um, but you have got a tabled note from the Parish Council, I believe. Um, Essentially, they seem to have read the report and then decided that actually it's not too bad. Um, here we go, just a second. If I can get this working. All right, here we go, I think we're there. Right, have you got my screen? I think you have, have you? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Right, anyway, so this is, so anyway, you've got that table note. And as you'll see, the parish council say they, they didn't really have time to respond when we got reconsulted them, so they didn't change their mind. But now they've seen the report, they kind of changed their mind um, and accept many of the arguments that the applicants presented, but they didn't say that before we wrote the report. Um, so this is the bungalow that we've got. It's a fairly simple looking bungalow with um, pretty standard concrete tiles, render and some black boarding on the ends, uh, on the gable ends. That's what it looks like now. Um, if I take you to there, proposed um, appearance. It's uh, rather simple. This is a bit of a diagram rather than a, obviously a, a proper drawing, but um, you can see it's clad. The whole building is then clad in black boarding and they producing the black uh, corrugated sheeting. And they send some examples of what they think this would actually look like more realistic. So what they're saying is that there are buildings built in the countryside which are of this ilk. Um, it's the sort of thing you see on TV programmes. Um, so they really want to change their jaded bungalow into something a little sharper and it gives them the opportunity to make it more energy efficient. They've moved on to the site with big ambitions um, for efficiency and self-sufficiency with their business. And, and they're saying, well, you know, people do build things like that in the countryside. Um, we've got this existing bungalow. Why don't we, you know, jazz it up a little bit? Um, so, I mean, I think we're quite supportive of this one because at the moment I don't think there's anything special to look at on the screen now. Um, it is in the AOMB, but it's not a good example of something we'd want to see in the AOMB. And I think that to turn it down with the black boarding, even though this plan is a little bit, um, these plans are a little bit uh, diagrammatic, does present just as an acceptable and attractive solution, which will match up with the farm buildings or are the other buildings that are adjacent and are being refurbished by them um, and that's simple the case and it's only here because the parish council have objected um, and didn't change their mind but now they might have thank you chairman thank you so thomas thank you very much um right and then move the officer recommendation thank you councillor jays uh, I open it to the floor. Councillor Simmons, please. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. Um, I must say, I did think the photograph 
the the change from the contrast with the the, the white walls and the and the, the tiles to the to the all black uh, structure, I, I I think is a bit st does stand out a bit in the countryside. I I, I that's my view, and I, I think that some some contrast within the building would have been desirable, but I don't suppose that's a ground for for refusing planning permission. But I, I do think that. It, it is a bit uh, a bit uh, brutal, perhaps. <laughs> it's a good word to describe it. <laughs> uh, not not necessarily this photograph, but the the, the other one that that, that Mr. Thomas um, showed us. So, there we are. That's all I've got to say about it, Chairman. Okay, thank you, members. Councillor Winkless. Thank you, Chair. I'll just like to quickly say. Um, looking at the existing uh, bungalow as it is and seeing what the uh, new design looks like if it gets passed, I personally think it's um, an improvement. So I should be going with the office recommendation. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Thank you. Councillor Hunt, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, and when we had the chairman's brief, I did say on this one, I just wondered why it was even coming to us in the first place, because at least the applicant did go back to the parish council and explain that it's just good to get that clarification from the parish council now. It's just a shame it wasn't earlier and we don't even, didn't even have to have this coming to us really. But. Yeah, agreed. So members, we go to the vote on this one. Those in favour of the official recommendation? Unanimous, thank you very much. So permission is granted subject to the issue of the decision notice. Um, now we move on to item 2-3 then, which is um, 22, oblique 500111, oblique full, and that's 137 Stirling Road, Tunstall. And I think this is you again, Mr Thomas. It, it is me again, Chairman, thank you. But there isn't any update at all. Um, this is the existing bungalow. Um, it's the left hand one of this pair, the one with the front bedroom window, the side landing dorm window and a rear bathroom dorm window. Um, the, the existing, sorry, the existing elevations um, may show you it's, 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 well, it isn't complete and all, so it's got these dorm windows. There are one or two bungalows left in Stirling Road that haven't got any dorm windows, but they're pretty hard to find. So they nearly all got these box dormers all over the place. Um, front, back and side, in this particular case, they're, they're not very good designs, of course, and we don't really approve those anymore. Um, and we probably didn't approve those because they're nearly all permitted development. Um, what's being proposed is to uh, replicate the front little um, bay window to make the lounge bigger and to put a picture of on their part of the dorm window to put a new dorm window here and uh, a new dorm into the bedroom. That's that one's the bathroom. And this is the big change at the back here where originally they proposed a similar dorm window to this one on the right as well. Um, I think I might have that. Um, the original proposed elevations showed this large dorm window on the back here. Um, all this, all this grey roof is new, of course, it's this darker area, but they proposed that. But the main reason that that was a problem for us was that um, if you look at the site location plan, it's on a corner plot, which is a great big, lovely corner plot, don't get me wrong. Um, but the dorm window here would have looked straight down from this position into the back garden here. So that's all one room upstairs, um, if I show you the floor plan. So we don't need that rear dorm window to light this bedroom, it's lit by the front dorm window. So we've asked them to take that off and put the, if they want a roof light at all at the back, to put it above eye level. And that's what they've done. So if we look at the floor plans, um, the amended floor plans I've got on here. Um, it's this, this this one bedroom to the to the end of the house. It's got a front dorm window here. Didn't need the rear dorm window. This dorm window is right at the boundary. Doesn't look towards the neighbour quite the same way. So we've got that resolved, and we've got some of the corrections to the plans. There was a few anomalies in the plans, but going back to the site location plan, um, I think you can see that this is a bigger than average plot. Just looking at this one here, most of these plots are pretty standard width. This is these ones on the corner clearly are bigger. They take advantage of the curve in the road, and there's plenty of scope here without crowding the area. We think at all it's an unusual opportunity within this 
pretty homogenous area um, where despite the original homogeneity, there's all sorts of extensions here um, of all debt dates and mostly done under permitted development. But this is, I think, again, like the one we brought to you in Rosie Road a couple of months ago, one of the better designed extensions we've seen of this ilk. And uh, we really don't see why there should be any objection to it. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. I right, move the offer recommendation. Could I have a second, please? Thank you very much. <coughs> Members, it's uh, over to you. Any comments? Also, it comes to Clark, please. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I'll be brief. I, I, I do know this area extremely well. Um, I'm up there quite a lot. Um, it, as Mr. Thomas says, it is an eclectic mix of original single story bungalows with small dormers in the in the roof panels. And over recent years, there have been a lot of sort of fairly large um, extensions. Most of them, I would say, um, you know, quite aesthetically pleasing. Um, and I, I don't see any reason why we should refuse this one because they've gone a long way to um, make it fit in with what's all around them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, anybody else? OK, we'll take this one to the vote then. Those in favour of the officer recommendation? Unanimously agreed, so permission is granted subject to the um, issue of the decision notice. And finally, we move on to uh, our part five items. Which are all purely delegated decisions. Um, and so I'll put that out to the oh, Councillor Jays. Five out of five, full house, well done to the officers, all the officers involved. Agreed. Councillor Beard. A specific comment on 5.4. Um, wholeheartedly endorse that decision both by the officers and by the inspectorate. Um, we have local plan policies in place for holiday parks for a reason, um, and I'm glad to see that they're being upheld. Um, and I would congratulate Philippa, who said to me earlier this evening that we would be finished by half nine, and I didn't believe her. <laughs> we won't be. <laughs> <laughs> so you're right to disbelieve her. Councillor Martin. Yeah, again, specific comment this time on 5.3. Well done to the officers on that one. Um, Good to see that we're holding the original design standards, given that Ashbury Close is a new development road. Hallelujah, we're not allowing them to keep that god awful uh, conversion of a uh, parking um, porch that people keep telling us apparently will always be used for parking and will never be converted to storage. Thank you, Councillor Hunt. I, I'll just say the same well done to officers. It's, it's, we're getting quite a few. Um, decisions through on appeals at the moment and it's good to have a whole run of good ones so i think next month won't be as good probably well, some months, but we will see yeah, yeah. <laughs> particularly pleasing for me was to see um the the bridesmaid coming to the fore and he doesn't get much chance of being the bride which is obviously simon olgar with his uh, conservation bits um i always feel as though he's, he's playing a the kind of bridesmaid's part so it's a it was nice to see that one as well um particularly at 5-1. OK, have I got past it yet? So members, if I could just thank you all for attending and um, hope you have a safe journey home um, and look forward to seeing you at our next meeting. Has it gone past 9.30? Right, fantastic. Safe journey home, good to see you all and um, see you next time. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, officers, too, of course.